In this video, I want to quickly run through an approach to FIR filter design using the FFT and to emphasize some common misconceptions in the process. The approach is based on the idea that the non-zero values of the impulse response of an FIR system will be equal to the B coefficients of the system. So for a general system of order P, the non-zero values of the impulse response will be the sequence of values B0, B1, B2, and so on up to BP. Now, if we have the impulse response, we can get the system's frequency response by taking its Fourier transform. However, it's important to realize, though, that the impulse response will go on forever and that an infinite sequence of zeros will follow the last non-zero value of the impulse response. In practice, we'll take the FFT of enough samples of the impulse response to get an adequate frequency resolution. In this case, I just used the non-zero values of the impulse response, but it has to be noted that these green data points are just a finite number of frequency bin values, which are essentially samples of the continuous frequency spectrum. If this all makes sense, then you could be led to believe that you could design an FIR filter with any frequency response by starting with the desired magnitude response, like the band reject filter shown, and taking the inverse FFT to get the B coefficients of the filter. And this is possible, and I'll provide a link to some example code in the description part of the video, However, your expectation might be that the continuous spectrum of the filter would look something like the blue line shown, but in reality the frequency response will be like the orange one if you use zero for phase values, or the yellow one if you were to use phase values which have a linear relationship, which I'll run through later on. The question remains as to why the frequency response has such significant ripples in it. And while there isn't a particularly quick and easy answer, the following overview might give you some idea as to why this happens. Although I'll have to fudge some of the detail to get the key concepts across. I think the easiest way to explain this is to consider the inverse FFT of a bandpass filter like the one shown, which is zeros at all bins except for bins 3 and 20, which have values of 1. If you've seen my videos on the DFT, you'd appreciate that the bins are associated with complex exponentials and that pairs of positive and negative complex exponentials create sinusoidal waveforms. Now, don't worry if this doesn't make complete sense, but the upshot is, is that if I inverse FFT certain pairs of bins, like the one shown, then I'll get back time domain samples that have a sinusoidal shape when plotted. So these values will become the B coefficients of my bandpass filter, and this filter would have an impulse response of these B coefficient values followed by an infinite number of zeros. So a plot of the first 300 values of the impulse response would look like the plot being shown on the top right. One way to think about this impulse response is as being a sinusoid, which by definition exists for all samples, being multiplied by what's referred to as a rectangular window. So the sinusoid on the left multiplied by the rectangular window in the middle is equal to the impulse response shown on the top right. Now the frequency content of a sinusoid looks like this, with two spikes or delta functions at the positive and negative frequencies of the complex exponentials associated with the sinusoid. The frequency content of a square wave has a sink shape to it, and I'll put a link in the description part of the video to a mathematical proof of this. Now multiplying the time domain sinusoidal waveform by the time domain rectangular window in this manner is equivalent to a process called convolution in the frequency domain. And the impact of this convolution process is that the sink shape associated with the rectangular window is reproduced at every occurrence of a spike. And we'll get a frequency response with significant ripples as shown at the bottom plot. And this is the frequency content of the impulse response shown on the top right which of course is an approximation of the continuous spectrum of the frequency response of the system we've just designed. I think it's important to note that the significant ripples are being caused by the rectangular window function. And again, I'll point you in the direction of the code provided to investigate this for yourself. Going back to our band reject filter, you can actually think of this as being a combination of lots of prototype bandpass filters like the one we've just seen with each pair of positive and negative complex exponential pairs being associated with a sinusoid of a particular frequency, which in turn is associated with a bandpass filter of a particular center frequency. Each of the pair of bins will contribute to the overall frequency response as been shown. If we finally add in the contribution from the DC bin to the responses of all the other individual bandpass filters, we'll actually get the frequency response of our heavily rippled band reject filter. 
Now up to this point I haven't been considering phase and have been incorrectly using phase values of zero which isn't practical because any practical causal system has delay components which inevitably introduce phase shifts. Usually a linear phase response is desirable in a practical filter in order to preserve the shape of the waveforms. And if I was to use linear phase values prior to inverse FFTing to get the B coefficients, then I would get a different impulse response and in turn a different frequency response. One which is better because all the ripples don't accumulate as badly as when zero phase is used. Just to finish up on this, we can reduce the ripples that occur in the frequency domain by applying a window function other than a rectangular window. Going back to our bandpass prototype filter, if I multiply the filter coefficients by what's known as a Hamming window, then you'll see that the ripples are reduced in the frequency domain at the cost of having a less selective bandpass filter in comparison to using a rectangular window. In other words, a filter with a less steep and poorer roll-off rate. You can use the same approach with the band reject filter we started with to get a reduction in the ripples as well. And once again, you'll notice a difference in the roll-off rate.